Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. One of my favorite songwriters and hymn writers, uh, Sandra McCracken, calls lament a, a holy complaint. Um, holy because we see the despair in the world, yet we recognize a God who can still do something about it and who has promised redemption of his creation. It's been another week of tragedy that hits close to home to us as believers, as parents, as teachers. When I, when I see something like happen this week, I think first about my kids, and I think next about my friends who are teachers and our church staff, Michelle, Anita, Michael, Brooke, they all serve as teachers or in the school system. I'm grateful for them and the love that they have for our kids out there. I'm grateful for our church staff. And we struggle to see the light in this darkness sometimes, but we know that we serve a resurrection God, and we're going to celebrate that today and this Sunday, next week. And he brings new life from death. So we wait, and we don't ask why, but we ask how long, God, how long until you wipe away the sadness and overturn it and make it all untrue, Restore your creation to its rightful place with its creator. So the psalmist sang out, how long? And the only time we see Christ sing in scripture is on the night of his betrayal. And certainly that wasn't a happy song. That was a song of lament. We see Paul singing loudly in the night, imprisoned. And we're going to do that just now. This song is called, How Long? How long will you turn your face away? How long do you hear us when we pray? On and on, still we walk this pilgrim way. How Till your children find their rest How long Till you draw them to your breast We go on Holding to your promises How long Till
Several months ago, we began our study in the book of Hebrews, and if you didn't know a whole lot of what it was in the book of Hebrews, I can pretty much assure you that uh, at least you knew there was a great chapter on faith in the book of Hebrews, right? The faith chapter, and often this passage of scripture, this chapter, is talked about in an isolated fashion talked about in in kind of distinction or difference from the rest of the book because it's so accessible. Uh, And even for those of us that may not live in the world and don't live in the world in which the original readers did, where they're being encouraged not to go back to Old Testament patterns of worship and sacrifice, we can read Hebrews 11 and be encouraged and have our faith deepened. Some of the commentaries that I've read this week have, have... gone through Hebrews chapter 11 very slowly and worked story by story in terms of the way they designed their commentaries. And that's one way to go through Hebrews 11. But I'm afraid if we did that and looked at it in small details, what we would do is we'd miss the larger reason why it's included in this place in the book. There is an intentional reason why the writer transitions to Old Testament heroes of faith in order to encourage New Testament believers not to turn away from God through Christ. And so with that said, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 in three Sundays. We're going to work through verse 16 today and then do the next section next week and then finish up the story, verse 32 through 40 or 39, uh, in, in two weeks. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. If you remembered, memorized this in the old King James Version, It says something like this, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the reality of things not seen. That's how I memorize this verse. In the SV, it's translated just a little differently. It reads, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We'll come back to that in a moment. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place and he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 
These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Beautiful set of verses, beautiful stories. One of the things we ought to appreciate, although there are many in this wonderful text of Scripture, one is that the examples used to describe faith are concrete. They're real-life examples. Why does that matter? Because oftentimes, folks, what we do is we tend to think of faith merely and only in, uh, in subjective terms. In internal terms, how, how do we feel? And, and even the translation of verse 1 kind of gets at that or hints at that. The book of Hebrews is all about confidence and assurance and, and resting in God, trusting in his plan, keeping and remaining with Christ. And so the ESV translates two words, translates the first word, the assurance, and the second word, the conviction, is in a definition of faith. And, and I understand that. I get that. I think that it makes sense because we need to be assured internally. But I'm really not sure that's the best translation of those words. I think the King James is probably a little better. And I, I'm going to make this argument for why. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why? Because there is a tension between faith being something that is subjective and faith being something that is objective. Okay, in our culture today, we have this giant tension between what is rational and what is faith. And, and, and those that would argue that rationality is where we find truth would say that what we do when we gather as believers on a Sunday morning, that may not be entirely rational. That's all about your faith. It's internal, it's subjective, it's feeling-oriented. And if that's the only place where our faith resides, then our faith as Christians is not all that altogether different from the faith of Muslims or the faith of Hindus or the faith, dare I say, of atheists who, who believe in certain aspects of, of truth or certain aspects of what they would articulate is going on in the world. And, and I understand that. There is an element of faith that is internal, that is subjective. But that's not, I think, the basis of faith as it is defined here in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is something that is far deeper than just how much faith you and I feel or how much faith you and I have. Faith is something that is objective. And I think in the text, faith defined, I'm giving you two little blanks, objectively, faith is the gift of God concerning the truth about Jesus Christ. It, and I, that fits the context. The writer here is telling the readers, yes, you need to have faith in God. But faith in God for what? Faith in God through Jesus Christ. And folks, let me say this very clearly. Whether or not you and I feel very close to the cross, whether or not you and I feel very close to the resurrection, whether or not you and I, to use the words in the ESV, whether or not you and I feel assured or feel the conviction of our faith, whether or not we feel those things does not change the reality that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a Roman cross. Does not change the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the dead. Does not change the fact that those events took place in history and that those events have brought about the salvation of sinners like you and me for 2,000 years of Christian history. Faith is a substance. It is something that is absolute, something that God gives to those who would put their faith and trust in him. Faith is substance. There's an objective nature to it. It is the evidence, meaning that, 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 the, that the writer wants us to look back and see all the things that God did through Jesus to fulfill the Old Testament. That's why he spent all this time arguing that Jesus is better than the angels and better than humans and better than Abraham and better than the law and better than the covenants. That's why the whole book of Hebrews is about Jesus and then trans transferring here to Hebrews 11, he's saying this is the substance, it's Jesus. Now subjectively, there is something that follows that. I think there is a subjective element to faith, certainly as we live out as Christians. Subjectively, faith is this. 
Faith is confidence in God through relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed, we have assurance. Yes, indeed, we have conviction. But we cannot find that by looking inside. We have to find that by looking to Christ. This whole text of Scripture should be interpreted Christologically. He is the focus of Hebrews 11. Certainly there are stories, but each of those stories point beyond themselves. In fact, one of the clear arguments from the latter part of this passage that we've read is that all of these who had faith did not receive fully what they expected when they expressed their faith. They were waiting for something more. Well, what is that something more? The writer points us to the something more. The something more is Jesus and is tremendously and gloriously encouraging. Faith is objective. It's a gift of God through Jesus Christ. It is subjective. It is a confidence and assurance that happens in relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's see how the writer begins to unpack this and give us the concrete examples that will help us develop our faith. And then we'll walk through several applications at the end. Look at verse 2. For by it the people of old received their commendation. I think it's fitting that the writer is going to spend, spend, did spend so much time showing the shortcomings of the old covenant, the, the fact that it didn't fulfill our salvation, and now he's going to spend an entire chapter commending the faith of those who existed in the old covenant. It, it, they were commended, not for their works, but for their faith. Here's the first concrete example, verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Uh, In other words, we accept that creation is something that God spoke into existence. And it is a genuine and a gigantic tension in the culture in which we live today. Scientists or atheists, or many scientists or atheists, not all by any stretch of the imagination, might argue that evolutionary theory is the means by which we came into existence, not the spoken word of God of creation. I don't have time to unpack all the details of why that is flawed. Let me make one uh, observation. In his book, Believing is Seeing, Michael Gillen, he, he asks several questions about the atheistic worldview, the scientific worldview, and the Christian worldview. Here are the questions he asks. He asks, does absolute truth exist? Are there truths that cannot be proven? And is the universe designed for life? He asks those three questions of those three worldviews. Interestingly, and and really maybe not so interestingly, uh, uh, those three questions are answered differently by atheists than they are the scientific worldview and the biblical worldview. In the the atheistic worldview, uh, they would argue that absolute truth does not exist because truth is relative, relative to situations, cultures, and circumstances. Atheists would say that there are truths that cannot be proven. Of course there are, because they would put any kind of religious truth in the category of truth that can't find proof. And then to the question, is the universe designed for life, atheists would say it only appears that way. Not absolutely that way. But the scientific worldview, and and all within the scientific worldview, and the Christian worldview, answer those questions differently. Is there absolute truth? Science and Christianity both say affirmative. Absolutely, there is absolute truth. Without question, there's absolute truth. The Bible articulates that both from a scientific worldview perspective, God created, spoke the world into existence, and a religious perspective. Scientific worldview says there are things, the law of entropy or the law of gravity or the other laws that Newton discovered, they're absolute. They're without question. They cannot be challenged. They cannot be thwarted. Does absolute truth exist? Yes. Are there truths that cannot be proven? Yes. There are truths that cannot be proven. Absolutely. There are truths that I cannot put forward to you in a way that everyone has to believe it. We have to accept some things by faith. But thirdly, is the universe designed for life? Yes. Both the scientific worldview and the Christian worldview say the exact same thing. I'll be honest with you, there's only an apparent contradiction between science and Christianity or a contradiction based on your particular worldview that determines how you're going to look at science. If you look at science objectively based on the things that science claims and the things that the Bible claims, they're in concert with one another. 
So when we look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by God. Folks, we don't have to stick our head in the sand and, and be thought of as mindless believers to, to hold on to the fact that God created the world. The reality is every single person on planet Earth that has ever dealt with the origin of life has to answer the question where the stuff came from that we live in, this world that we live in. Somebody, something, some event brought about the existence of the stuff that we had. And even those in an evolutionary world, you can't answer that question. They can't answer what is behind the stuff that, in their view, maybe it exploded or however they came about the origin of the universe. Biblical Christianity, the Bible says God's spoken into its existence, which is not inconsistent at all with what we see nor inconsistent with science. I'll give you a second concrete example. And he gets very personal in these next examples, very individual and relational. He talks about Abel. By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. This relates to our worship. So you know the story of Cain and Abel. We won't spend a whole lot of time here. But Abel offered an animal sacrifice. And Cain offered a sacrifice from the fruit of the ground. And God accepted Abel's sacrifice. God did not accept Cain's sacrifice. Why is that? What's the distinction? What was the problem? Does God not accept grains? He did in the Old Testament, in the, in the, the books of Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There are opportunities for you to offer a grain offering or a first fruit offering. Here's the problem, though. Cain brought an offering he wanted to bring. Abel brought the offering God said to bring. There's an obedience issue. Abel followed what God said. Cain followed what he wanted. Really, we could spend a whole lot of time there, and we may, in the coming months, come back to the Cain and Abel story and discuss the two different viewpoints of religion here. Essentially, Cain did what he wanted. He was not accepted by God. Abel did what he wanted, or what God wanted, and was accepted. But there's also a Christological implication here. Why did God accept Abel's offering of an animal? Because years before, when Adam and Eve had sinned, God covered Adam and Eve's shame and nakedness with an animal. And that points forward to a sacrifice that was going to take place thousands of years later when God was going to cover our shame and nakedness and sin with the sacrifice of someone else. Not an animal, not a lamb or a goat or a sheep or a bull or an oxen, but Jesus himself. Let me tell you something, folks. Our worship should be done in faith. Amen, Dr. Mike? But I want to tell you, sometimes you don't feel very like you have faith when you walk in. Just remember, the faith that you have that expresses itself in worship is rooted in what Jesus already did, not rooted in how you feel. It's not rooted in the assurance or confidence that we can have, we should have. It's not rooted there, though. It's only experienced there. It's rooted in the sacrifice of Jesus. Because of what he did every time I gather, whether I feel like it or not, whether I enjoy it or not, whether I, it, it moves my soul or whether it doesn't, whether I'm afraid or nervous or scared, whatever it is, no matter how I feel, the truth of what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago is what gives the foundation and framework to my worship and your worship. And the next concrete example is walking with God. Look at the story of Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. And before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Enoch gives this glorious example of what it means to walk with God. He walked with God for 300 years, the book of Genesis says. Because he walked with God, God took him. He didn't taste death. Not sure exactly how that happened. The text doesn't tell us. It says that God took him. It's a long time to walk with God. 300 years. How about this? This should encourage us. If you think about Abel and Enoch. Abel obeyed God and was murdered. Enoch walked with God and never died. Why did God allow Abel to die and Enoch to be taken into heaven? I don't have... The answers for that, but here's what I do know. What I do know is God accepted Abel and God accepted Enoch. 
And for those of you that are Christians that go through times of suffering or death that appears to be far too early in life, doesn't mean God loves you any less. doesn't mean God accepts your family any less. For those that never see death or resurrected, right? In, in Enoch's case, the, the picture is that all Christians are represented here. Those that see death, those that will experience suffering and difficulty, those that will experience the resurrection in the future. There is a hope that is there. By faith, Abel worshipped. By faith, Enoch walked with God. Just a personal kind of confession here. This is what the Lord's dealing with me about. Walking with him. Not worrying about all the other stuff, just walking with him. How do we do that? We do that by faith, folks. By faith, Enoch walked with God. And you get the story uh, there in, in verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know, the only way you can please God is by faith. The only way. God isn't looking for our intellect. He's not looking for our offerings. He's not looking for all the other things that sometimes we think are associated with making, with pleasing God. He's looking for our faith, our trust in him, our dependence on him. We'll come back to why that is so important in a moment. Uh, verse 7, by faith Noah. So you have worship, you have walking with God, uh, worship with Ab Abel, walking with God with Enoch. And then with Noah, you have rescue and salvation by faith Noah. Notice this, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, and in reverent fear constructed an ark. So you've got Noah, this glorious example of faith. A beautiful picture, a, a glorious image of what it means to trust in God. But Noah spent a hundred years building the ark. Do you realize that? I wonder how many times he got discouraged. Hundred times, hundred. Look, I'm gonna make a confession. My son is in Science Olympiad, and uh, and he's got this project that he signed up for. He's got to build a musical instrument, which means dad and mom have to help him build a musical instrument. We've been doing this for about three weeks, and I'll be honest with you, I have been frustrated and frustrated and frustrated on several occasions through this process. And we, I think we have something that will work that fits within the parameters. It's three weeks. And not straightforward three weeks. Noah built an ark for a hundred years. Can you imagine that there were some mornings he got up and his conviction wasn't there? His assurance wasn't there? He didn't feel like doing what God had assigned him to do. But notice the basis on which he had faith. What God had said. God had said. God had warned him. And his response to what God had said. The issue wasn't his feeling. The issue was his obedience based on what God had objectively stated. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what you're going to do in response to what I'm going to bring about in the world. And Noah and his family experienced rescue. Not only Noah, but there's Abraham. Abraham journeyed to the promised land. He journeyed there, and the text tells us he journeyed there with Isaac and Jacob, it, it, essentially carrying with it the idea of his progeny that were traveling with him. Picture, though, is that Abraham didn't know where he was going. Do you realize that? In the book of Genesis, God said, Get up and go to a land I will show you. When he set out on the journey, he didn't know the end destination. He just knew that he was supposed to go. Man, that's a testimony of faith. That's a glorious picture. And you know what happened when Abraham got there? The text tells us here in Hebrews 11. He got there. He resided there. He sojourned there, but it was never his land. He never inherited the land that God said he was going to give him. Nor did Isaac, nor did Jacob, nor did Joseph. Patriarchs spent the next 400 years, the people of Israel, the next 400 years in Egypt. The land of promise that God told Abraham about didn't come about until 400 plus years after Abraham's life. Yet Abraham had faith. How about Sarah? By faith, Sarah. 90 years old. 90 years old. I don't think anybody in here meets 90 yet. Anybody looking forward to your first child or your next child at your age in life? Sarah didn't have a child at this age in her life. 90 years old, she believed God. Abraham believed God, and God gave them the child of promise. 
God gave them Isaac that was to come and that was to be the one through whom the promises were fulfilled. What a story. What a picture of faith. Now, there are a couple of things I want you to notice about these, particularly with Enoch and with Noah, with Abraham, and with Sarah. Their faith happened over a long period of time. 30, 40 years for Abraham and Sarah. Noah, 100 years building the ark. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Long time of faith. Long time of depending and walking with God. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. If they can believe, so can we. There's another thing that's important for us to grasp here. They didn't always, always have faith well. You can go back and read the stories of particularly Abraham and Sarah. They believed God, but until they didn't believe God in this particular situation or circumstances. They doubted, they disbelieved, they didn't trust. And here's the important point for that. The important point for for, for that is not that our faith rests on the amount of confidence and assurance we have. That's why I think it's better to translate verse 1 objectively than subjectively. Our faith does not rest on the amount of assurance and conviction I have. Our faith rests on the person in whom we have faith. The strength of the one in whom we believe is what matters, more so than the strength of what we bring to our faith. It's a beautiful picture of what God has done. Now, I want you to notice something about all of these concrete examples. They never received the fulfillment of what they longed for, save maybe Noah. He received rescue, but even that rescue was imperfect. It was only rescue from a flood. It wasn't rescue ultimately from sin, because what happened... After the flood, he got drunk, and his son sinned, and all of this stuff happened. The sin that we needed rescue from was still present. Look at what happened with Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, they had Isaac, but they'd also had Ishmael, and there created a division there because they tried to accomplish God's promise a different way or an unfulfilled way. All of these promises, and the text tells us later on, look at verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. All of these only received a small measure of the affirmation of the faith they had, not the full fulfillment of the faith that was to come in the future. Now, these are glorious examples of faith, and the reason the writer draws our attention to them is he's saying to the Christian readers, he's saying to the readers, uh, the original readers of the book of Hebrews, if Abraham and Noah and Abel can have faith and can have faith even though they don't see the full fulfillment of their faith, if they can have faith then we ought to have faith because you have Jesus today. You have something more. We have something better. We have something more grounded, more assured, more confident, more evidenced than even Abraham had or Noah had or Abel had or Enoch had. We have Jesus today. He's with us. He's in our very midst. He's present in your life and in my life. What can give us any more assurance than trusting in Jesus? Nothing can. No one can give us more assurance than Jesus in his presence. And the anticipation is that if they were waiting for something that they never saw fulfilled, we can wait for something that we anticipate will be fulfilled. The place called heaven. The place where God has prepared us, a city in which to meet him. Folks, Only by faith can we know Christ. You can't know Christ any other way other than putting your hope and trust in him alone. Only by faith can we walk with Christ. There's no means for walking with God based on our efforts. It's only by trusting in Jesus. Only by faith can we go to be with Christ. Some of you are longing for that place called heaven. Some of you want to go there one day. I do. The only way we go there, the only pathway for us as Christians is through faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, how do we apply this? How do we put this into practice? What do we do with a sermon like this? I'll give you three applications. Here's the first one. We accept that what God says is true. Our faith is, indeed, based on the firm foundation, as we just sang, of God's Word. By faith, we believe that God created the world out of His spoken Word. Noah's faith was based on what God said. Abraham's faith was based on what God said. 
Sarah's faith was based on what God said. Folks, you know the best way to ground your faith? Based it on what God has said. When we accept that what God says is true, and we open God's Word and read it as truth, that is the starting point for Christian faith. Let me get, give us a second application. We have to admit our need. That's why faith is the, the category for us as Christians for responding to God. Okay, one of the things that you've got to grasp about all these examples is that faith tells us that we're not. Faith reminds us where we are short. The reason, the only reason, or the primary reason why faith is the means by which we receive God through Jesus Christ is because it acknowledges that we are not able in and of ourselves. We're not capable. It's not about us. It's not about our efforts or works or good deeds or righteousness. It's Cain's problem. Cain was trying to do, come to God his way with his sacrifice. And all too many people in our world, all too many people in our Christian experience, somebody I talked to just this week, she's trying to get to God her way. She's trying to pray better. She's trying to be nicer. She's trying to be kinder. And I'll be honest with you, our world would be better if we had nicer, kinder people. If we had people that were more holy and whole than they are broken and disheveled, we would be. And and I commend anyone who gives an effort to make the world better by being better. The problem is we can never approach God that way. We can never get to God that way because God isn't waiting on us to express a certain amount of ability, effort, goodness, or righteousness. Faith acknowledges that we're going to fall short that we have fallen short, that we'll never attain God in our own goodness and righteousness, so we must admit our need. Beloved, if you're an unbeliever, we have to accept that what God says is true, and we have to admit our need. That is the pathway to salvation. But Christian, expressing faith in God is no different. It is... I accept that what God says is true. What God says about me is true. What God says about Jesus is true. What God says about my future is true. And I admit, I still have to admit. Some of you still need to admit. Lord, I'm not doing too good believing today. I'm I'm, I'm struggling, so I admit my need. I admit where I fall short. And do you know what happens every time we admit our need? God comes through. We admit our need. Thirdly. We ask Christ to rescue us. For me, I shared last week that took place when I was 18 years old. Trusted in Jesus to be my Savior. I don't need salvation again, nor do you, if you've trusted in Jesus for the first time. That is also the last time that you need to trust in Jesus to be your Savior. But do you realize over and over and over again I have to ask God for help through Jesus? We do that over and over again. Why do we do that? Why why is it good for us to do that? Folks, because he's the only means of rescue. He's the only means of help. And when we ask him, we trust that he knows best. When we ask him, we trust that only is he, he is able. I was reading through some of the prayer requests you put down from last week's information sheets. Folks, we just need to ask God. We need to take our request to God. That is an expression of faith. Let me illustrate it this way as we close. I I came across this in my study this week about a traveling evangelist who had visited a hospital in London many years ago. He visited the children's wing of that hospital. There was a little boy there. His name was Willie. He had had a really high fever. And his roommate was a little boy that had been hit hit by a bus. His body was mangled and, and broken. They were in that room together, kind of sharing conversation. The second boy, the boy that got hit by, hit by a bus, said to Willie, he said, Willie, I, I had been down to the Mission Sunday School, and uh, at that Mission Sunday School, they, they told us that we could ask Jesus to help us, that we could ask Jesus to rescue us, and that if we asked him in faith, he would help. And, uh, and the, the, the little boy, Willie, the first little boy, said, well, well what do I do if, if I'm asleep when Jesus comes, and how can I ask him to, to help me if, if he shows up and, and I'm, I'm not awake? 
second little boy looked at him and said, well, here's what we do. In Sunday school, we just raise our hand, and the teacher calls on us. So I guess if you just raise your hand, then Jesus will see your hand, and, and he'll answer your request. That night, first little boy, uh, Willie, who had the fever, he was too weak to hold his own hand up. So his buddy uh, helped him prop his hand up on the pillow like this as he went to sleep that night. The nurse came in the next morning. Willie had died in his sleep. But his hand was still raised, acknowledging that he needed help from Jesus. Acknowledging that he was wanting Jesus to offer him salvation and rescue. Christian, we just need to go to Jesus. We just need to ask. We just need to trust. If you're here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, all you need to do is ask him, and he will forgive and cleanse and rescue you. Stand with me, if you will. Our Father, we come to you freely admitting how short we fall sometimes. We're grateful for the testimony and encouragement of these examples and illustrations of faith. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would deepen our understanding. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help our faith. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would remind us our faith depends on you, not on us. And Lord, as we depend on you, we pray that you would give us a stronger assurance and a conviction and a trust and a dependence on you, acknowledging that it is only through you. But I know in this room there are some burdens that need to be brought to you, and I pray that they would. I know there are some lost people connected to our church that need salvation. I pray that this day, this week, would be the week in which they put their faith and trust in you and receive salvation. Lord, we pray that you would help us trust you, help us hear from you, help us receive the help we need. We pray this in Christ's name. You come. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org. Or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.